Good evening. Thank you for joining us here at Central Church of Christ for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We're so thankful you could join us here tonight. We hope that you're ready to study along with us and do our deep dive of the kingdom of Israel. In terms of our announcements, let's remember those on our sick list. Let's pray for uh, David Finney and Miss Clara as they're still uh, fighting some ongoing health problems. Let's just pray for them and their health. Uh, let's also rejoice and praise God for our, our new brother in Christ we had on Sunday. Uh, Jack Woodard was baptized, and so let's rejoice with him and, and uh, just pray for him and be with him and strengthen him as much as we can. Tonight, we're going to continue our look into the kingdom of Israel. We're going to be looking at 2 Kings chapters 11 through 13. So I hope you'll join with me there in just a moment. But before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to come before you and to open up our hearts to you, to seek you and ask you for guidance and for strength, for forgiveness and mercy, to show you our love for you and our desire to be more like you every day. Father, we pray that you be with all those who are ill and struggling with illness, uh, those among our number, such as David Finney and Miss Claire, we pray that you'll just strengthen them and heal them if it is your will. Father, we rejoice with Jack that he has obeyed you and been uh, obeyed your gospel and been saved, and we pray that you will just strengthen him along this new walk, this new journey that he has uh, committed himself to. Father, we pray that you'll be with us in our study, that you'll guide us through it. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Open with me to 2 Kings chapter 11, please. 2 Kings chapter 11. This evening, we're going to study the idea of Judah rebuilding while Israel continues to fall. And we're going to see some different glimpses, going to flip back and forth between the two kingdoms. And I'm going to do my best to just guide us through that and keep us focused on what's going on. In order to do that, we begin in verse 1 of chapter 11. Now, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal family. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being put to death. And she put him and his nurse in a bedroom. Thus they hid him from Athaliah, so that he was not put to death. And he remained with her six years, hidden in the house of the Lord, while Athaliah reigned over the land. We begin this chapter with a story of the evil queen. Now, this is the story, uh, this begins in Judah, where we have just read in chapters 10 about, or 9 and 10, of Jehu dealing with the line of Ahab as God had commanded him to. And it ended up with him wiping out Ahaziah and, and Jehoram, and, and dealing with these two sons of Ahab and their families. But here we read of Athaliah. Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah. Now, she wasn't related to Ahab, she was just an in-law of Ahab. But she is left alive. And here we see that she is power hungry and violent. That she wants to be queen. She wants to rule Judah. And so she takes control of that rule and kills her family. She, we read in verse 1 that she destroys all of the royal family. She, she gets rid of anybody who might have a claim to the throne over her. But she misses, misses one person. She misses Joash because Jehosheba, the daughter of Joram, takes him away and hides him. She hides him and his nurse in the bedroom, and eventually he and that nurse end up living in the house of the Lord, the temple, hidden from Athaliah. Joash is saved from her wrath, and that becomes important because then chapter 11 all turns into, after six years of her reign, of Joash's claim to rule, Joash's power and those who are working with him. And we get to that in verse 4. Or if you'll read with me, we're going to read a rather lengthy bit of this passage because it's good for us to just get an image of what God says happens. In verse 4, it says this, But in the seventh year of Jehoiada, or, but in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of the Karaites and of the guards and had them come to him in the house of the Lord. And he made a covenant with them and put them under oath in the house of the Lord. And he showed them the king's son. And he commanded them, This is the thing that you shall do. One third of you, those who come off duty on the Sabbath and guard the king's house, another third being at the gate, sir, and a third of being at the gate behind the guards, shall guard the palace. And the two divisions of you which come on duty in force on the Sabbath and guard the house of the Lord on behalf of the king shall surround the king, each with his weapons and his hand. And whoever approaches the ranks is to be put to death. But be with the king when he goes out and when he comes in. The captains did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded, and they each brought his men who were to go off duty on the Sabbath, with those who were to come on duty on the Sabbath, and came to Jehoiada the priest. And the priest gave to the captains the spears and shields that had been King David's, which were in the house of the Lord, 
And the guard stood, every man and with his weapons in his hand, from the south side of the house to the north side of the house, around the altar and, and, and the house on behalf of the king. Then he brought out the king's son and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. And they proclaimed him king and anointed him, and they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. Chapter 11 is really all about the reign of Joash. Now, I do want us to understand that this can be confusing at times because there's another Joash, king of Israel. So we're going to refer to the king of Judah as Joash. And the king of Israel, when we get to that, as Jehoash. There's an extra H in there, and hopefully we'll be able to just keep them separate. But here we see that the reign of Joash is about to begin. And it's all led by Jehoiada, the high priest, when he concocts this revolution against Athaliah. He realizes and he sees that he has the rightful heir to the throne, and so he sets in motion the the acts to involve or to to announce Joash as king. And so what he does is he finds supporters for Joash. He goes and gets the captains of the army and of the guards and have them come into the temple, and he makes them promise that they will uh, keep this safe, keep this uh, uh, in. Uh, that they will work with him, that they will work with Joash. And he then shows them that Joash is alive. Now, this would only work if Athaliah was this terrible queen. And what we read is that she really was. She was a horrible queen. I mean, so much so, if, if we just start off with the fact that she killed her whole family to rule, we can understand that she is probably not the kindest of queens. Jehoiada enacts this plan for Joash. And it all involves or revolves around Joash's safety and includes these kingly weapons. We see that Jehoiada says, one third of you guards are going to protect the king when you're off duty. The other two are going to protect the, the palace and the house of the king. And it's all just going to work to where Joash is completely surrounded by protection. And you know what you're going to use to be protect, to protecting the king? He goes out and gets spears and shields that have been King David's. Weapons of their most revered king. And he says, this is what you're going to use to protect the rightful king of Judah. Imagine that. Imagine if you're that, that captain of the guard or one of the, the guards himself. And you're able to wield one of these spears that King David and his men wielded in the, with the power of God. That's an amazing thing. That would show you and remind you that this is the rightful way to, or the rightful person on the throne. And that you're protecting what is right. What we see is that Joash is rightly crowned while Athaliah is rightly dethroned. That he is, he is taken into to the temple and he is uh, pronounced king and they give him the testimony and everyone is praising him and shouting out, long live the king. And Athaliah hears this from, from the palace. And she goes to the temple and she says, she sees all that's happening. She sees Joash being crowned, pronounced king and she cries out, treason, treason. Which I find rather ironic, seeing as, as she was treasonous to begin her rule. She didn't have a right to the throne. But she made it her own. She committed treason to rule. And so she is, she is crying out to it. And Jehoiada just calls for her death. He says, look, she needs to be put to death. She needs to be killed for her actions. But they don't do it in the house of the Lord. They take her to, to really the, the stable to kill her. So that she is kind of just out of sight, out of mind. Joash is now king. Rightfully so. He is the right king of Judah. And he will rule for a while. But we see before this rule actually starts off and begins, Jehoiada leads the people of Judah to a covenant with God. He makes a covenant between God and the people and the king and the people that they will commit themselves to God. They will be the Lord's people and the Lord will be their God. And in doing so, when they commit and make this covenant, they then go into the house of Baal and tear down all of his altars and the images. They kill the high priest of Baal and they, they deal with this idolatry that had been so rampant in their kingdom. And the people are rejoicing. The city was quiet. The city was peaceful with this new king. And thus, that's how his reign begins. And we see at the end of chapter 11 that Jehoash, or Joash was seven years old when he began to reign. He was a young king. But that doesn't mean he was without uh, wisdom or without help. Because we see he leans upon Jehoiada for many, much of his rule. And he will end up ruling for 40 years. And that's where we get to in chapter 12. Where we then begin to read about the actions of Joash. If you'll begin with me, we're going to begin in verse 1. In the seventh year of Jehu, Joash began to reign, and he reigned forty years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba, and Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all his days, because Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people continued to sacrifice and make offerings on the high places. Jehoash said to the priests, 
all the money of the holy things that is brought into the house of the Lord, the money for which each man is assessed, the money from the assessment of persons, and the money that a man's heart prompts him to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priest take each from his donor, and let them repair the house wherever any need of repairs is discovered. But by the twenty-third year of King Jehoash, the priests had made no repairs on the house. Therefore King Jehoash summoned Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said to them, Why are you not repairing the house? Now therefore take no more money from your donors, but hand it over for the repair of the house. So the priests agreed that they should take no more money from the people, and that they should not repair the house. Then Jehoiada the priest took a chest and bored a hole in the lid of it, and set it beside the altar on the right side as one entered the house of the Lord. And the priests who guarded the threshold put, it in, put in it all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. And whenever they saw there was much money in the chest, the king's secretary and high priest came up, and they bagged and counted the money that was found in the house of the Lord. Then they would give the money that was weighed into the hands of the workmen who had the oversight of the house of the Lord. Joash's actions when he begins his reigns are all good actions. What we see is that this is a good king guided by God's spoken word. That as he is leading the people, he is guided by Jehoiada, the high priest, the one who had made the covenant between the king and the people and the, and the people and God. We see that he is grounded in this. He is grounded in God's word and he becomes this good king. Although we do see there's a blemish on that in verse 3 that he doesn't deal with all the high places of idolatry. But he is a good king. And we see that this goodness goes on to where he plans the temple repairs. He wants the temple to be rebuilt and remade into all of its glory as Solomon had made it. And so he makes these plans. He tells the priest, hey, all the money, all the tithing you get for, for uh, worship and for, for everything that is owed to God, use it to rebuild the house. But we, what we see is that within or after about 15 years pass, there's no repairs being made onto the temple. And, and he's frustrated. He calls everyone in. He says, why aren't you repairing this? Why aren't you doing this? So he says, don't take any more money. Don't do it. Start by repairing and then we'll deal with it from there. So Joash actually makes sure that the repairs are done right. He wants them to be built. He wants them to be uh, correctly done and the money properly used. And what he says, he does, what we see that he does is he takes the job out of the hands of the priests and puts it into the hands of actual workers, actual people whose job it is to build and repair things. We see that he, he uses the money and that Jehoiada actually helps him with this, where uh, when they do get start receiving more money, the, uh, the high treasurer and the high priest are coming and they count it up and they send it immediately to those workers. And if you look down with me in verse 15, we see that there's no need for an accountant, that they did not ask for an accounting from the men in whose hand they delivered that money to pay out to the workmen, for they dealt honestly. This is honest work being paid properly and honestly. That they aren't shorting each other on work or on payment. That it's all being done for the glory of God. The temple is rebuilt. The temple is being repaired. And we see that during this time, it's not a peaceful time for Judah. That in verse 17 through, through 18, we see that Haziel of Syria goes up against Jerusalem. He goes to fight it. Joash says, hold up. He goes and gets as much treasury as he can, and he sends him to Hazel. He wants Hazel to stop this fight so that his city, his people, will not be defeated. His people will be safe. And so he wards off enemies of Jerusalem. Joash is this good king. He is this good man who is trying to do right by God and right by his people. But what we see is that the end of his life is actually sad. We see that Joash... Uh, Joash acts rashly with Jehoiada's lineage, and he pays the price. If you'll read with me starting in verse 19, it says this. Now the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? His servants arose and made a conspiracy and struck down Joash in the house of Milo on the way that goes down to Silla. It was Josachar, the son of Shemeath, and Jehozabad, the son of Shomer, his servants, who struck him down so that he died. And they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Amaziah, his son, reigned in his place. What we need to understand about this is that it's actually expounded upon more in the book of Chronicles. What we understand is that Jehoiada dies. And Jehoiada's son is lifted up to be the high priest, but Joash doesn't like that. He actually deals treacherously. He rejects the son of Jehoiada, even after all that Jehoiada had done for Joash. And so when this happens, Joash's servants conspire to kill him. And they kill him just because of that, because of how he handled Jehoiada's lineage. You see, Joash acted rashly. He acted uh, wrongfully 
against Jehoiada's lineage. And he pays the price. He dies because of it. And that's how chapter 12 ends. And then right there, we actually kind of get a pause. Because what we see in the lineage of the kings is, is oftentimes we'll look at one king and then it'll flip to the other kingdom and say, during this year of that king we just looked at, this is what was happening in the other kingdom. And so that's what we do here in, in chapter 13, is that we get a look into Israel and the Israelite kings, Jehoaz and Jehoash. If you'll read with me, we're going to begin in verse 1. In the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 17 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin, and he did not depart from them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them continually into the hand of Haziel, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel. Then Jehoahaz sought the favor of the Lord, and the Lord listened to him. For he saw the oppression of Israel, how the king of Syria oppressed them. Therefore the Lord gave Israel a savior, so that they escaped from the hand of the Syrians, and that the people of Israel lived in their homes as formerly. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin, but walked in them. And the Asherah also remained in Samaria. For there was not left to Jehoahaz an army of more than fifty horsemen and ten chariots and ten thousand footmen. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like dust at threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did and his mighty, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Jehoahaz slept with his fathers and they buried him in Samaria. And Joash's son reigned in his place. In the thirty-seventh year of Joash king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, began to reign over Israel and Samaria. And he reigned 16 years. He also did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin, but walked in them. Now the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, are in the, mighty with, or in the might with which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Joash slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat on his throne. And Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. The Israelite kings that we get to glimpse into are Jehoahaz and Jehoash. And we, we see that they reign from the 23rd year of Ahaziah, uh, king of Judah, all the way through the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah. So it's this, this long reign, this long period of their reign. And so we begin with Jehoahaz, and what we see is that he has a 17 year of reign, and he's evil. He's wicked. He, again, is described as following in the sins of Jeroboam, the king who, who made Israel to sin. Jehoahaz leads Israel to sinning. And so what does God do? Well, God punishes Israel via Syria. He sends the Syrian armies to siege Israel, constantly giving them into the hand of Haziel and Ben-Hadad. But then we see something that Jehoahaz do, does. You see, Jehoahaz does something other Israelite kings fail to do. He seeks God. He prays out to God and he cries out to God asking for salvation against the oppression of which he is suffering, of which the people of Israel are, are suffering. And God answers him. God hears him and he saves Israel. He grants them a savior so that they can live in their homes as formerly. But, formerly. but what we see is that Israel still returns to sin. That this great gift from God, this great salvation from God does nothing to turn them away from idolatry, to turn them away from evil and wickedness. So that's where we read about Jehoahaz. The Jehoahaz does one good thing, but lives wickedly and evilly and still continues to turn his people towards idolatry. And when he dies, his son, Jehoash, reigns in Israel. And this is where we kind of get that, uh, we can get uh, mis uh, misconnected or misunderstand the way it is because Joash and Judah and Jehoash and Israel, they are the same names interchanged. What we have to understand is that if we call Joash of Judah, Joash, then we can also call uh, the king of Israel Jehoash. It's, it's just a way of s separating the two and understanding which one we're talking about. So we see that Jehoash reigns in Israel. And what he does is he reigns for 16 years doing evil. He too, like his father and his father's father and his father's 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 fathers, leads Israel like Jeroboam. He leads them to sin. Now, we are going to read about Joash later on in next week about some of the things he does. We actually get a little foreshadowing here that he fights against Amaziah, king of Judah. But Jeho Joash, Jehoash is not a good king. He is evil. He is wicked. He is sinful. And this really leads to what we'll get to in a couple of weeks, to the fall of Israel. Is that this line of Israelite kings is never good. It's always sinful. It's always wicked. 
And we'll see that as we continue. Now, chapter 13 ends with a tragic note. Even more tragic than the evilness of the kings of Israel. Because in chapter 13, we get the end of Elisha, the, the great prophet. We get Elisha's last acts. And if you'll read with me, starting in verse 14, it says this. Now, when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Draw the bow. And he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria. For you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you have made an end of it. But now you will only strike down Syria three times. So Elisha died, and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Now Haziel, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them. And turned toward them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, nor has he cast them from his presence until now. When Hazael, king of Syria, died, Ben Hadad, his son, became king in his place. Then Jehoash, the son of Jehoaz, took again from Ben Hadad, the son of Hazael, the cities that he was taken from Jehoahaz, his father in war. Three times Joash defeated him and recovered the cities of Israel. When we read of Elisha's last acts, they are still rather great acts. But it begins with the fact that Elisha is deathly ill. He has been struck with an illness that he will die. We understand that. And when this happens, we see that the king of Israel, Jehoash, goes and cries to Elisha. He seeks Elisha's aid from Syria. And we see this interesting note, or this interesting saying that he gives to him. My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. Now, if we recall, when we think back to Elisha's own anointing as the prophet, we're walking with Elijah before Elijah is taken up in a chariot. He cries out this same, same thing to Elijah. Why? Because he understands that Elijah was God's messenger, that Elijah was God's prophet. But here we get a completely different meaning of this. You see, Jehoash viewed Elisha as a means to victory, not as a spiritual guide. He goes down to Elisha and sees him as a way to defeat his enemies, as a way to be victorious and to save his own bacon. Not as a way to guide the people towards God, not as a way to save his, his soul and to lead the people towards salvation. No, he only views Elisha as a tool of war. But even still, Elisha works great things. Well, you see, Elisha works three more miracles here. It begins with this bow. He has Jehoash grab a bow and he draws the arrow. And then he, he helps shoot this arrow with the king of Joash. And he says, this is the arrow of victory. This is what God is going to use to give you victory over the Syrians tomorrow. But then he has something else done. He tells the king of Israel, he says, now grab those arrows and stab them into the ground. Strike them into the ground. And Jehoash does it. He does it three times, and then he stops. Now, when we look at this, we think, well, three times, that's decent. That's a good amount. You know, it's, uh, he may not have really understood. But what we see is that Elijah's actually angry with him. He's upset that he didn't continue and keep going with those arrows. And he says, you should have struck five or six times, because then Syria would have truly been defeated. Then Syria would have been wiped out, and you wouldn't have to deal with them anymore. But now you're only going to defeat them three times. But then his final miracle, maybe one of his best, you see, after he has died, he's been buried. But we get this interesting note that, that someone else is being buried and, and is pushed into the grave of Elisha because of a, a marauding band of Moab. And as soon as he touches Elisha, he is revived. He is immediately given new life. And that's his last miracle, a resurrection. You see, Elisha was a great prophet, working the word of God into everybody else. Now, 
this chapter does end with Jehoash defeating Syria three times. But he does not completely defeat them because they'll come back. They'll continue to fight against Israel. We see God's word rings true. Elisha was right when he said you, can, you will defeat them three times and take back three things or you will overcome him three times. And he does. Now, chapter 13 ends with this sadness, but really the entire book of 2 Kings is filled with sadness. It's filled with tragedy. It's filled with, with disobedience and rejection of God. And next week, we'll see some more of that. But before we go tonight, let's end with some application. First, evil motives lead to terrible actions. We see that with, within Athaliah. We see that within the, the kings of Israel. We see that in all of really the book of 2 Kings. Evil motives lead to terrible actions. Athaliah kills her family so that she can have power. Think about our own lives. When we want to give in to sin, whether that's our anger, our greed, or our lust, or, or anything that we can think of, it often leads to some terrible actions. It often leads to us hurting people, to us uh, damaging relationships, and, and breaking things down. Evil motives lead to terrible actions with terrible consequences. But then we get a glimpse into some good in this, in this book. We see that a spiritual friend is a great tool of faith. That when we surround ourselves with our own Jehoidas, as Joash did in Judah, then we can be aided greatly in our walk of faith. We can have someone we can lean upon and ask, hey, do you think this is right or do you think this is wrong? We can ask someone for strength and guidance, and they'll be able to give it. A spiritual friend is this great tool of faith and one that we should all be seeking. And finally, I want us to note that God expects us to do more than the bare minimum. That's probably the main thing that I can take from this, this passage in chapter 13, when, when King Jehoash stabs the ground three times instead of five or six. That he kind of caps it. He, he may have done it half-heartedly or lackadaisically. But we see that in Elisha's reaction, he says, you should have gone that with this gung-ho and with full force. You should have kept going and kept going until you grew tired, basically. God expects us to do more than the bare minimum, to do more than just going to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, to do more than just watching a video presentation of God's word, to do more than just praying before meals. He expects us to keep doing his word and to do it at our very best. And that's how we are seen as God's children. I appreciate you joining us this evening for class. I hope this class has been beneficial to you and edifying. If you have any questions about this class or anything that has been said, please reach out to me. I'd love nothing more than to talk more about the Bible with you. And if you have any need of this congregation, whether it's the prayers of this group or, or you want to obey the gospel, please reach out to us. We'd love nothing more than to help you in your walk of faith. I hope you'll join us again on Sunday as we meet together for worship service. Until then, have a blessed week.